So thanks everybody for coming out to the first uh, Pittsburgh QA event. Um, I am going to completely bore you for the next 15 minutes on regulated environments and testing thereof. So my name is uh, Jared Bill and I'm a test engineer at Omnix and uh, we do have some QA positions available. So you'll get a quick little preview of uh, what it's like to work in a regulated environment and a little bit about Omnix. So if you're interested, let's talk afterwards. Okay, so what are you going to walk away with in the next, well, 12 to 15 minutes? We'll see how long I go. Um, I'm going to give you a quick little intro about Omnix. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what uh, Omnix does and what we build. We're going to talk a little bit about regulatory bodies and how they come into play uh, with our products. I'm going to give you a little bit of background about what a device history file is. We're going to talk about verification and validation. And uh, you probably get the theme at this point, but hold questions till the end. We'll have a little roundtable discussion. All right. So what does Omnix do? Well, to, to answer that question, we really need to talk about pathology. Okay, so what is pathology? It's the science of the causes and effects of diseases, especially the branch of medicine that deals with laboratory examination of samples of body tissue for diagnostic or forensic purposes. <sighs> So what does that really mean? Okay, so you see the person there looking through uh, the microscope, and this is basically what a pathologist does on a day-to-day -day basis. They take microscope slides, they look at tissue at a very high resolution, and they look for patterns, anomalies, things like that, and that ultimately leads to a diagnosis. Sounds fantastic, right? In practice, it's not as clean and pretty as what you see in the top left corner. In fact, this is kind of what it really looks like. So down here you have stacks of cases of patient slides. This is, these are tissue taken from a patient. This is all the paperwork associated with those cases. And this is uh, what it looks like on the doctor's desk, right? And so I don't know about you, but for me, that's a little bit scary, okay? If, uh, if I'm being uh, looked at or reviewed for a deadly illness, uh, cancer or anything of that nature, You'd hope that it's a little more organized than stacks of cases and paper uh, actually the way it happens. So in the modern world, we can do a little bit better than that, right? So that's where Onlix comes into play. So Onlix creates digital pathology solutions where we build medical devices, which are scanners. We uh, ingest microscope slides. Those slides are then scanned at a very high resolution. And uh, so this top uh, scanner is the product that I work on right now. Uh, it's called the VL120, and it accepts 120 slides. The VL4 uh, <laughs> uh, accepts four slides, and that's our uh, predecessor uh, device. Okay, the other part of our, of our whole solution is uh, some software to present this information. So on the right screen, you see two slides being uh, compared side by side with different stains. And on the left monitor, you see all the case information about that patient where the doctor can review the slide and make notes and then send that information back so that the patient can be diagnosed, okay? So that's great. So what is involved with uh, building medical devices? So one of the very first things that you run up against is um, regulatory bodies, all right? So in the context of a medical device, there are some primary players, okay? So in, here I'm calling out three different regions, but there are many of these, okay? So in the US, we're primarily dealing with the FDA, and when you go and you submit for um, permission to sell, what you're really seeking is either uh, pre-market approval, a PMA, or a 510K, okay? So what does that mean? Um, a PMA is basically you have a new idea and you want to get it out into the field for the first time. And so you present all this evidence, all this uh, data, you submit it to the FDA, they review it and they say, okay, your product is safe for use, right? A 510K is slightly different than that. So this is where you're going to compare yourself to an existing technology and basically prove that you're no worse than that product, you're equivalent, okay? So if we move over to Canada, um, you're primarily dealing with Health Canada, and you are seeking a Health Canada license. In Europe, uh, there's a few different paths. You can do uh, self-certification. You can get like a third-party um, audit or a notified body review. Or you can get a design uh, dossier, okay? Now, the, the route that you pick here is highly dependent on what classification your medical device is. 
okay? So in general, there are three classifications for medical devices. One, two, and three. One is the least risk. Three is the highest risk, okay? So just to give you a quick example of that, a class one medical device might be like a toothbrush, okay? So very low risk that someone's gonna be harmed using a toothbrush, and so it's classified in the lower end. Uh, on the other hand, uh, a pacemaker, right, something that is implanted in your body and could shock the crap out of you, um, is a class three device, okay? So to make this even more confusing, you can have a single device in different classes depending on where you're submitting. So for example, in the United States, the FDA has reviewed our information and they've decided you're a class three device, whereas in Canada and Europe, we're a class two device. Okay, so this is all very highly uh, subjective, sort of, and uh, it's really kind of based on the comfort level of the regulatory bodies that are reviewing you. Oh, by the way, in Europe, you're looking to achieve a CE mark. So you may have seen that symbol on some of your products at home, and that basically means that that product is safe to sell in Europe. All right, so with that said, I am gonna give you a very boring slide of definitions now, but I think that it really frames up uh, kind of the idea here. So when we talk about a design history file, I realize that's really hard to read up there, uh, but a design history file is really sort of uh, the design controls around a, uh, a product. So the FDA does not prescribe a process that a company has to use. What it does say is these are the things that we want to have from you so that we can properly review your uh, equipment, your device. So it's completely the onus of the company to provide all of that evidence in the right manner. And so this is kind of the layout. This is, if you imagine these are, are folders, and each folder would have kind of subsections. So let's just go down through them real quick. Uh, design input is not, nothing more than really requirements. And design outputs are the specifications that trace back to those inputs. Design review is a cross-functional review of implementation. Design verification is, uh, provides objective evidence that what you said you were gonna build in the inputs is actually built correctly. Design validation verifies that uh, the, the user needs are met. And then you can transfer your design to manufacturing through design transfer, and then once it's transferred, any changes are documented to the design. So I want to point something out here. Uh, like most companies, um, your requirements are really kind of the control point as to how much work, in a sense, or how much churn that your development team is going to have, okay? And we'll get into that a little bit more here, but uh, just real quick, just going to throw out a feeler. What does this kind of remind, remind you guys of? Hey, I was expecting to have to give you a hint. Very good. <laughs> All right. So, yeah, so this is very, very much so set up to uh, work well with um, long-running government sort of projects, uh, things like that. And so in, in the modern age that we're in, we all want to be lean and agile, right? We want to release quickly, you know, like uh, think through math. But um, so uh, we kind of run up against uh, some sort of a... Um, we, have a, we end up uh, having a problem here because the way the, the organizations or the regular, regulated bodies want us to operate really kind of collides with the way that we want to operate. Okay, so what does this look like? I'm glad you asked. Okay, so on a day-to-day -day basis when we talk about verification, there's really kind of uh, two buckets that they fall into. On the left we have I'll call normal verification, and on the right we have capital V verification, very formal. Okay, so on the left, we're, we operate as a scrum team in an agile way, and this is where our teams are writing test cases and doing exploratory testing, we're collecting data, we're doing studies, and we're really throwing everything we have at this product to make sure that we feel confident that it's ready for production use, okay? So this is really about our organization gaining confidence that what we've built is working correctly. When we move into formal verification, we really want everything to be lined up and, and, and working, okay? The formal verification run is not intended really to uncover bugs, okay? We're expecting when the verification runs, it would be great if everything passed and it's 
kind of a formality, right? So all these records that are, are, uh, are created, this is an example, I know you can't read the text, you're not supposed to, but it, it's just a test case that's laid out and you know this is what kind of is generated as objective evidence. This goes into the design history file. This is what the, the paperwork that an auditor would review if they would come in and do an audit, okay? So this basically shows that you have test cases that map back to all of your inputs, your requirements, okay? So what does this look like when we do this formal run? Well, we have like golden data sets, right? So all the data is, is predefined or built up into these big golden data sets. During a test run, we don't wanna have to create like a user account or a patient record. All that stuff's established for us already so that we can narrow in and test just the single input, the design input requirement that, that is of in interest. Predefined built environments, and then you get into uh, device production equivalents or uh, production intent. Um, so we want to be executing these test cases on the closest thing we have to a production device. Okay, so we wouldn't want to run our formal verification run on an old prototype uh, scanner. Okay. And finally, you have formal defects. So when you're running a verification protocol, if you do encounter a defect, it's not the end of the world, right? That, we expect that, that's why we do testing. But what, it does, what does happen is, is this is looked at very closely. This gets in front of cross-functional teams. They deliberate on you know, how serious is it, and then they make a group decision on how to, how to move forward, okay? So you have your opportunity up, up front as a development team to be lean and agile to knock all these bugs out, but if you don't find something and it ends up being found during a formal verification run, it's not the end of the world, but it's a little bit tougher, right? Okay. So this is my last slide, by the way. When we talk about validation, um, validation is just a little bit different. So validation isn't really set up to be, uh, for lack of a better word, a, a paper exercise, right? This is really getting our feelers out into our users and trying to see, um, you know, did we build the right thing? So in this picture, you see a user, uh, a pathologist, a model, um, using our device, and on the right side, he's doing a diagnosis of tissue. And on the left side, he has the case up, right? And so when, when you do this sort of uh, a run, you're looking for a lot of different things. One of the things is human factors, okay? So if I'm building a large device that has a hole that's just big enough for my finger to fit into, I wanna make sure that it doesn't chop my finger off whenever I put my finger in there, right? Because users are gonna do whatever users can do, okay? So you wanna be smart and intelligent about the way you design something. Performance can be a factor. So one of the big things that we have um, right now is, uh, you know, our, our doctor, so believe it or not, so the microscope, let me take a step back real quick. So the microscope itself has been really around since like 1500s, late 1500s, okay? And it was first used for observable um, recording around 1665, okay? And that, obviously we've got better at building microscopes, but the technology largely hasn't changed since then, okay? And so, one of the nice things about using a microscope today is it's very fast, okay? A doctor can take a slide, put it under a microscope, look at it, and then boom, grab the next one, move. So if, if this doctor was trying to keep up with his normal workflow and it took two hours for him to load a slide or a case, obviously that's a problem, okay? Usability. Very, very similar to human factors, but when I think about usability, I think about is the design intuitive, right? So are you using standard icons? If you have your own custom icons, do they make sense? You know, does it, when an empirical user looks at that icon, do they basically know what they're getting themselves into by clicking that button? Uh, repeatability, so when you run these validation uh, sessions, you want to do it in a controlled environment. So if you were to run the same validation session again, you'd largely receive the same results. Okay, so you don't want it to be biased in any way. And all this kind of leads up to the classic meme, I'm sure, you know, all the good developers and testers here in the audience are familiar with this meme. But for those, if anybody is not familiar, I'll run through it very quickly. On the left-hand side, you see how the customer explained what they wanted built. The next one over is how the project leader understood it. The next one over is how the analyst designed it. 
how the programmer wrote it, and then finally, the way the customer really wanted. So we, we want to make sure that we're building rubber tires. <laughs> okay, so um, thanks a lot, everybody. And like I said, we, we do have a two, at least two testing uh, positions open. And if you're interested in learning more about Omics, come and find me after the talk, and I will recommend you so that I can get a bonus. <laughs> <laughs>